This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 10. Morality. 100. The old moral question of whether one thinks first of oneself or of others falls apart when we come to think only of ourselves and for this reason negate the otherness of others. 101. Intelligence ends where morality begins. Morality ends where intelligence begins. The theory of practice, the unitary critique of all ideology, must at the same time be the critique not only of any moralism, but of any possible moralism. Every moral is subjectivity disowned and subjectivity alienated. Every moral is a psychic totem, a mental fetish object, before which the moral fetishist subordinates himself, bows down, and offers sacrifice indeed offers himself in sacrifice. Every ideal is separated subjectivity, a part of the self separated off, ejected, frozen, and held over the rest of the self. It is a depletion of subjectivity, a loss of freedom, a choice made in advance. The formation of the moral ideal is at the same time a decline in subjective mobility and maneuverability, a ball and chain about the dancer's ankle, a self-laming and self-maiming in the dance of life. 102. Morality, and that which ties you to it, self-guilt, guilt for even being, is an enormous encumbrance. You can throw it off. You can drop all that weighty moral baggage before it drags you down. You don't need it. It is but a poor substitute for the fine tool of practical intelligence, expanded self-interest, self-consciousness itself. When, if I should encounter a contradiction between a useful abstraction I had made about my practice and my concrete self-interest in a given situation, if I abandon my concrete desire in favor of the practice of that abstraction, that mere generalization, out of abstract respect for superficial consistency, or, say, at the behest of another, who threatens me with the word hypocrite, then I am projecting that abstraction into a position above myself, freezing it into a principle, a moral, and I am reproducing as an ideologue the other person who has rebuked me in comparison to that moral, by being susceptible to him, expropriating the representation of myself which I have erected or condoned, and using it against my real self. As a mere generalization, a practical abstraction, as theory, I have already refuted it for myself in practice, proven its invalidity for this instance. But as a moral reification, on the contrary, it is my duty to obey it. Not I, but it, is my master. It gives the orders. I alienate my will into it. It is the subject of my practice. I, its object. 103. The projections of my subjectivity, nurtured by guilt, stick out of my head like so many handles offered to any manipulator, any ideologue who wants to get a hold of me, and whose trade skill is the ability to perceive such handles. Only when I dissolve my guilt, when I free myself to be shamelessly selfish, when I grasp selfishness as my only duty, taking care of myself as necessarily my first social responsibility, can I be free. 104. The critique of the totemic relationship clarified by Feuerbach in relation to religion, then supplied to political economy by Marx, and lately developed one-sidedly by the Gestalt therapists, especially Pearls, locates the inversion that lies at the heart of all domination and self-enslavement. Totemic fetishism, or projection, lies also at the heart of every moral ideology, which is revealed also in the observation that every ideology is a moralism and a social plan for the allocation of guilt. While usable precisely for the same ends, ideology in general, moralism in particular, are in essence the more sophisticated and subtle means of exploitation, as opposed to naked coercion. 105. It is my guilt about my desires, which makes me susceptible to ideological exploitation by others, and which motivates me in producing excuses and justifications, rationalizations, in terms of the dominant ideology the ideology which I let dominate me. 
The trick of ideology consists in this. To represent desires in a pseudo-universal, i.e. unselfish, altruistic, and therefore unreproachable form, always in terms of some abstract, general interest. In order to reconcile myself with my ideology, I must make myself a liar. But it is a loser's game. The lawyers of the dominant class already have it set up in advance their way, and here I am on their terrain. The use value of practical generalizations is that of theory, intelligence of human practice, knowledge of means, techniques, and consequences. The use value of morality is that of ideology, to dominate others, to attempt to get what is wanted in a narrowly selfish way, by representing it as unselfish, universal, in a climate where transparent selfishness and transparency about desires is not tolerated, is chastised. 106. In the abstract negation of morality, its mere antithesis, typical especially of the situationist mentality, moralism is transformed into anti-moralism, which is really only an anti-moralism moralism, and not truly the opposite of moralism at all. According to the logical substructure of this ideology, one has a duty to do at all times what is immoral according to the dominant ideology, that is, the ideology by which the situation is still defines and dominates himself, though here in a negative form. Thus it is abstractly required to live by stealing, to practice sexual promiscuity, to live in squalor, to drop out of school, to never work, etc., etc. This is still qualitatively as far from the determinate negation of moralism as is moralism itself. 107. As for ourselves, we have no morality. We have only our feelings, our needs, our desires, our thoughts, our consciousness, our practical knowledge of practical consequences at each given stage of our development. In short, our subjectivities, ourselves. Compassion doesn't need to be coerced out of us. It comes naturally. We feel others' suffering as well as their joy because we are open to feeling our own. 108. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of men is a demand for their real happiness. The call to abandon their illusions about their conditions is a call to abandon a condition which requires illusions. Their criticism of religion is, therefore, the embryonic criticism of this veil of tears of which religion is the halo. Criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers from the chain, not in order that man shall bear the chain without caprice or consolation, but so that he shall cast off the chain and pluck the living flower. The criticism of religion disillusions man so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality as a man who has lost his illusions and regained his reason, so that he will revolve about himself as his own true son. Religion is only the illusory son about which man revolves so long as he does not revolve about himself. As with religion, so with respect to the other projections, individual and collective, commodities, money, capital, the state, ideologies of every description, morality in particular, reified hierarchical institutions of all sorts, pseudo-subjects all. Try substituting them in. 109. The criticism of religion ends with the doctrine that man is the supreme being for man. It ends, therefore, with the categorical imperative to overthrow all those conditions in which man is a humiliated, enslaved, despised, and rejected being. 110. The criticism of morality ends with the doctrine that you are the supreme being for you, that is, your being, your self-consciousness, your being for yourself, is the necessary medium through which all other values, which constitute or give content to its value, including my value for you or myself as one of your values, come into being for you. If you should lose your being, then all other beings, and therewith all values, would be lost to you. Further and more concretely, to the extent that we produce socially, and that we produce a society, that we exchange self-powers and their objectifications, that we depend upon one another for the reproduction of ourselves, then my loss, or the loss of me, is your loss, and a depletion of yourself. 
It ends, therefore, with the categorical imperative to overthrow all those conditions under which you, the subject, are subordinated to some thing, some fetish, some totem, some projection, some reification, some cause, some ideal, some moral, some principle, some pseudo-subject, some being supposedly higher than yourself. 111. What cause or ideal is there, what projection out of yourself, that can be higher for you than you, its source? What external to yourself that you value can warrant for you your sacrifice? What value is there that you would not lose if you lost yourself? Something can be a value for you only if it includes and conserves in it yourself, the necessary foundation of all your values. When you are lost to you, all the emanations of yourself and all the values in the world that you affirmed are lost for you also, cut off at their root. Taking risks is another matter. You must gamble yourself in order to gain any value. You must risk yourself in order to gain yourself back again more richly. What is called cowardice is not the practice of the realization expressed above, but its opposite. Too little value placed on oneself and on those values and other persons which are part of it, so that one fails to defend oneself in the expanded sense, or mistakes mere survival for life. 112. It is not by any means only the narrowly selfish, egoistic desires and tendencies which are repressed continually, moralistically, while at the same time being reinforced practically in the daily life of privatized society, but also, really more so, the non-egoistic, the so-called unselfish tendencies, natural gregariousness, spontaneous human solidarity, natural compassion and empathy, simple sociability and love. There is an energy produced in each human being every day which aims at a social satisfaction and which, if not satisfied socially, turns against itself, becomes depression, withdrawal, etc. Unlike tribal societies, wherein these unselfish tendencies form the main base of social survival, in our society, overdeveloped, late capitalist society, these emotions only break surface occasionally, exceptionally. In the vast accumulations of constant and variable capital known today as cities, the continual steadfast repression of these tendencies is increasingly a necessity of survival. With increasing rarity does social good feeling pass between strangers on the street. Any stranger is best regarded an enemy. And these teeming anthills are a world of strangers. The growing phenomenon of mass random murders can be understood as a becoming apparent of what was always essential to capitalist society, now entering its historic extremity. The war of all against all is becoming armed. Once anesthetized, beginning in the early life of the individual, these social desires and tendencies can usually be re-evoked only falsely, artificially, coercively. Hence the belief that these emotions need to be enforced through the manipulation of guilt. Anyone still manifesting such tendencies in their direct, spontaneous form into young adulthood is immediately suspect or at best considered naive and a fool for his apparent idealism and or childishness, despite all the altruistic pretenses of official society. These emotional tendencies are being seen as a weakness, which, in the society of estrangement they undoubtedly are, until or unless such an individual develops full consciousness of these tendencies and of their social context, appropriating these as part of a revolutionary project. 113. I listen to criticism because I am greedy. I listen to criticism because I am selfish. I would not deny myself another's insights. But egoistic criticism is a use value, or it is nothing. Use value not only to its recipient, but to its donor as well. I would not bother to criticize someone in whom I had no interest. Anything else would be service rendered to an ideal, a moral projection. Only a moralist seeks to strike against what contradicts him, his moral, equally over the whole manifold of space-time. Only an ideal is eternal in this way, whereas I am mortal. My libido is concentrated around myself. 
its intensity falls off exponentially with subjective distance from its source. This egoistic criticism is the opposite of the masochistic and ritualized spectacular criticism and self-criticism of Maoist morality. Authoritarian criticism aims at my repression, at reinforcing and reproducing passivity and servility, at maintaining the habit of submission. It aims at weakening rather than strengthening my subjectivity, at keeping me an authoritarian personality, a slave. Egoistic criticism, on the contrary, aims at strengthening me. In the mutual interest of myself and my critic, for the benefit of our common wealth and our common project, it is imminent criticism, criticism of me in my own interest. By the same token, for such criticism to be possible, for someone's criticism to interest me, I must see myself in them and them in myself. We must share a common interest, a concrete community. 114. The critique of revolutionary ideology, anarchist and Leninist alike, with its sacrificial collectivist morality, and in particular the critique of Maoism with its morality of poverty, reveals once and for all the poverty of all morality. And this in a double sense. First, in that morality is the ideological product of poverty, of the underdeveloped state of human productive forces, and especially of the cleavage of the general and particular interests, whose root is the self-cleavage of society, social classes. Morality is the expression of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. It locates the general interest as a projection out of a social situation in which it could only be found as a contradiction. In morality, the contradiction is represented as an abstract identity of the interests of all men, as the interest of an abstract man who has no real social existence. Second, in the sense that morality, which is projection or self-disowning, is a depletion of the real social wealth of subjectivity, the wealth of the self. 115. Our subjectivity and our self-rediscovery in every here and now, i.e. our self-reproduction, is the only possible guarantee of our subjectivity. We must rewin ourselves constantly. Communist egoism can be made into an ideology. The right to be greedy can be turned into a morality, easily. No objectification is immune. This ideology begins whenever some bureaucrat, for this act would confirm him so being, tries to order me in the name of my self-interest, to desist from some activity I have freely undertaken on the grounds that it is objectively sacrificial, and I let him get away with it. Here is revealed the lie of representation. He represents me even against myself. He owns me, is more me than I am. If I keep this up, the final scenario can be easily envisioned. Some bureaucrat points a gun at me, saying, in the name of your expanded self-interest, that of the proletariat as a whole, we have determined that it is best for you, for us, to kill you, and pulls the trigger. 116. In a revolutionary situation, it takes much more than the mere wish to prevent a bureaucracy from arising. The roots of bureaucracy lie in personal self-denial, in treating myself and my desires in a bureaucratic manner, in short, being a bureaucrat with myself. The mere abstract negation of its institutionalized form is like arriving with a bucket of water after the house has already burned down. In every rationalization and hesitation, in every stuttering and swallowing down of desire, of felt resentments, miscommunications, and secret humiliations, lie the seeds of our demise, our thermidor. The logical outgrowth of any self-denial by any revolutionary is the triumph of the counter-revolution and the reign of the Bolsheviks all over again. It is always the principle of useful suffering and willing sacrifice that forms the most solid base for hierarchical power. The moment you sit by passively while not getting what you want, you are preparing the ground for your own destruction. 117. We are on the verge of liberation only, when it can be said of each of us that he, she, has become so rebellious, 
so irrepressible and so unruly, that she, he, cannot be mastered by anything less than his, her, self, i.e., among other things, when no mere projection or reification of a part of ourselves will suffice any longer, or will be able successfully to rule over us. 118. The game is a form of armor. Ideology is a game. Character armor is compulsive role-playing. The script is the self-image projected through time, the temporalized self-spectacle. In the white heat of the act of their comprehension as lived experience and as interpersonal praxis going on all around us, these names and the concepts they name, game, armor, ideology, role, character, script, melt into one. The self-spectacle, the spectacular self, self-representation, will be found necessary, a necessary use value, a necessary interpersonal tool, in fact, a survival kit, and thus be reproduced, so long as, one, the dissonance of egoisms, the totality of conditions known in general as poverty, scarcity, prevails, and consequently, two, people cannot get what they want often enough by being transparent with one another, by simply asking for it, and three, they cannot or will not take the risk of asking, the gamble of transparency, either for fear of the pain of refusal or out of the desperation of their need, and would therefore prefer to extract what they can by circuitous means, by subterfuge and deception, decoy and trickery, in short, by intransparent means. The spectacular presentation of self in everyday life, the personal organization of false appearances, persona, partly compulsive and involuntary as especially in muscle armor, the little lie, these are the means of the devious route to the realization of desire. In their conscious part, they will be resorted to so long as the more direct means, transparency, does not work any better. In their more unconscious, compulsive part, they are the mark of repression and domination, the cowering wince of the whipped cur, frozen into a posture. Character armor is indeed the form of people's complicity in the spectacle. Not that feeling guilty about one's character armor will do anything but exacerbate this problem. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.